Katie Hopkins, a cup of tea, and a rendezvous in York at the home of Sanjo, Sanjoy Bhattacharya is why we're all here today. It's a tale for another time, but it is a real pleasure to be back at my old university. I'm known for keeping my presentations short, but today, ladies and gentlemen, buckle in because you're in for a 45 minute journey. This week is National Hate Crime Awareness Week. We meet as hateful rhetoric, swamp social network feeds and divisive narratives poison our national politics. In an, in an intervention I have thought about long and hard and one that could not be more tragically timely than now. Over a decade ago in government in 2011, within 12 months of my cabinet career, I spoke out on this issue. Islamophobia passing the dinner table test was the first time a major speech on anti-Muslim prejudice had been made by a cabinet minister, let alone from the Conservative Party, even less the chairman. And having been part of the optimistic early Cameron years with a commitment to get language right, a questioning of ideology and a concerted effort to engage openly, honestly and authentically. And I want to quote David Cameron for you. 2006, this is what he said. That is why we must not stoop to conquer. We must not stoop to illiberalism, whether at Guantanamo Bay or here at home with excessive periods of detention without trial. We must not turn a blind eye to the excesses of our allies, abusers of human rights in some Arab countries, or disproportionate Israeli bombing. We are fighting for the principles of civilization. Let us not abandon those principles in the methods that we employ. 2006. 2007, let me quote again for what David Cameron said. I try not to use the phrases like Islamist terrorists because I think British Muslims read that and think he just means me. So we are all trying to find a way through this language, descriptions more accurate than those that we've used in the past, end quote. I say that because there was a period when we started to get it right. But post the appalling Blair years of patronizing engagement and caustic language, which had started the process, I believe, of vilification of British Muslims, I genuinely felt we could change direction and step away from the now much discredited neoconservative thinking being imported from the US, thinking that new labor had become enamored with. I've spoken to many cabinet ministers and advisors from the new Labour years who have candidly spoken of the ideological and blinkered rot that had set in on this policy area. And it wasn't until the late years of the Labour government under a Gordon Brown administration that some sanity was restored. I recall proudly saying that the UK is the best place to be a Muslim, and when I looked at the ways in which European counterparts purported to uphold the liberty of their citizens by banning headscarves in classrooms and banning burkinis on the beach, banning minarets because they caused offence, and even calling for a ban of religious texts, I felt proud that even during moments like the ex-Foreign Secretary Jack Straw's unwelcome and uninvited soiree into women's closets, my colleagues seemed to instinctively fall on the right side of the argument. However, by early 2011, talk of muscular liberalism and attacks on multiculturalism started to infect conservative politics. A party that prided itself on individual liberty, freedom of speech and freedom of religion found itself setting a vision for British Muslims in conflicts with its own stated values. I saw this up close and firsthand, and much of that time is well documented in my book, The Enemy Within, in the chapter, The Paranoid State. In a nutshell, policymaking started to exceptionalize the way we engaged with, judged, and viewed British Muslims. One set of rules for everyone else, but a higher standard and different set of rules for British Muslims. Think tanks, the editorial bias of certain papers, and ideological crusader-like cabinet colleagues for whom fact and expert evidence was simply an irritating distraction, fed the frenzy of bad policymaking rooted in a new acceptable, dare I say socially respectable form of racism, the kind casually discussed around the dinner table. So let me recap what that speech in 2011 said. Much has been made of the dinner table reference, but the principal arguments were these. Firstly, the bifurcation of Muslims into moderates and extremists, a clumsy, incorrect and theologically unsound designation 
foisted upon a worldwide community of nearly 2 billion. Since then, the language has changed. Talk is now of Islamist, a phrase which has dozens of potential meanings, again explained in detail in the book, and non-Islamist, but the connotations are the same. It is but a fig leaf often used by Islamophobes to disguise their bigotry. Secondly, the discomfort around those who faithfully observe religious practice as opposed to those who wear their faith lightly. Thirdly, the elision of Islamophobic discourse into mainstream politics and media via think tanks, journalists and politicians under the guise of challenging orthodoxies around institutional religion and in the stated pursuit of freedom of speech. And fourthly, the exceptionalizing of Muslims to demarcate them from other groups. I've often been asked why I felt necessary to give that speech at that time and that in many ways it marked my political cards. I've been asked again this week why I choose to intervene again. I did so and do so because the evidence of the silencing, stigmatizing and stereotyping of British Muslims is stifling communities. Its corrosive impact on public discourse and public opinion is real. The approach is deliberate and the consequences if we follow this approach to its natural conclusion are catastrophic. Ladies and gentlemen, this climate is not led by the British people, our fellow citizens. The everyday encounters and relationships between us all are organically made and are resilient. But this is a dangerous and deliberate attempt by some in politics, some in the media, some in think tanks, to divide, demonize and demarcate the other. Individuals who pose as patriots, but behave as arsonists, setting our country alight and creating uncertain futures for all of us here. Multiculturalism has not and is not failing in this country, but there is a deliberate and concerted attempt by some to not let it succeed. I am therefore sounding the sirens and I ask you to sound them with me. But let me start with some things that we got right acknowledging some early positive steps. After huge rows within government, funding was made in the early coalition years to set up a CST-like organization to record and capture data on anti-Muslim attacks. The first review of the Prevent Strategy in 2011 raised the important issue that Islamophobia was a driver of radicalization. The Protection of Freedoms Act 2012, which abolished New Labour's Section 44 of the Terrorism Act 2000, Stop and Search, and introduced Section 47A, curtailing police powers to stop and search without reasonable suspicion. Antisocial Behaviour, Crime and Policing Act 2014, which brought in some respite amendments to the Schedule 7 stop powers. The Leveson inquiry in the wake of the phone hacking scandal, amongst other issues, examined instances of press bias against Muslims, asylum seekers and refugees. A BME 2020 strategy was developed. The introduction of police recorded crime data on Islamophobia, an initiative led by police and crime commissioners. Remembering Srebrenica, a countrywide programme to remember and learn from the Srebrenica genocide of Muslims on European soil in our times was launched although funding for this highly successful program has been increasingly cut in recent times. There was a recognition of monitoring Islamophobia around the world by the FCO through the inclusion of anti-Muslim hatred in the annual Human Rights and Democracy Report published by the FCO, again, sadly removed from the 2015 report onwards. I set out these examples because some attempts were made to get some things right in addressing the challenges of racism in society. And some of these measures had some positive impact on British Muslims. But sadly, some, if not most measures, have since been reversed, like the stop and search changes. The Leveson inquiry recommendation on media were never fully implemented, with government shying away from the creation of a press regulator with teeth that would tackle the breaches of standards on accuracy and discrimination that blight reporting on Islam and Muslims in the media. But even during what, looking back, feels like a golden era, specific policy areas we got badly wrong. The introduction and subsequent use of the closed material proceedings in the Justice and Security Act has rightly caused much concern. The expansion of counterterrorism into the vague nonviolent extremism space without detail or clarity. 
The Trojan horse affair with the handling of it by Michael Gove, which supercharged the course of hostile policymaking regarding British Muslims, despite the letter that triggered the whole saga being proven to be a hoax, with investigations concluding it was bogus. The leaking of the letter by Michael Gove's department unleashing a torrent of inflammatory media coverage and the collapse of the disciplinary hearings against Muslim teachers. Implicated after the Department of Education failed to supply evidence to support their own case. And yet to date, there has been no recourse for justice for the teachers, no remedial action for the schools dragged into the public glare of negative media coverage, no effort at a public relations strategy to rebuild confidence in Muslim communities and schools affected by the government's mishandling, and crucially, no apology to any of those harmed, including children, by the government's action. Why? Because sadly, Muslims don't matter. But it wasn't just the proactive policy making we got wrong. We also failed to respond to our, we also failed to respond when our fellow British Muslims came under attack. The very first role of government to protect its citizens. In 2013, our shamefully inadequate response to the detection of bombs planted in mosques in the West, Mid in the West Midlands as part of a race war plot orchestrated by the far-right Pavlo Lapshin and the murder of Mohammed Salim. And again with the murder of Mohsin Ahmed in Rotherham in 2016 by two thugs who stomped on his head as he made his way home after dawn prayers while verbally abusing him and calling him a groomer. And it seems no lessons have been learned with both Suella Braverman and her predecessors, Priti Patel and Sajid Javid, continuing to propagate and popularize notions of Muslim grooming gangs, even though evidence from the Home Office itself contradicts this. Braverman went further this year, falsely asserting that child abuse was, I quote, almost all British Pakistani men, end quote, a divisive comment she has had to roll back from and one proven earlier this month to be false and misleading with the Mail on Sunday having to issue a correction. So why can they stereotype and stigmatize in this way? Because sadly, Muslims don't matter. But one of the most fascinating areas of policy that I have seen develop and ironically unravel has been the prevent statutory duty introduced in the Counterterrorism and Security Act 2015. The prevent duty has been the precursor to what we all now know to be cancel culture. British Muslims were the first community in our country to be cancelled, something I lay out in some detail again in my book. A policy of disengagement that was started by New Labour continued in coalition years and taken further by the Conservatives. Encouraged by right-wing think tanks and newspapers who tracked and took to task British Muslims in ways no other community was subjected to. Creating a chilling effect, pushing Muslims out of the public domain on fear of being tarnished as extremists and finding tenuous links to cancel individuals through a guilt by association approach. Universities, arenas for open debate and critical thought too contributed to risk averse strategies, shutting down free speech and healthy debate and more recently used in schools, including here in Leeds, to police and silence children wanting to show solidarity within the law with Palestinian children. I have taken call after call from anxious parents fearful of the climate in schools, in colleges and universities, and the impact it is having on the confidence of their children and their future career prospects. This stifling of free speech and this silencing has to stop. But here's the irony. The government's announcement of the appointment of a free speech champion to uphold freedom of expression on campuses as it continues to enforce the prevent duty. So free speech for everyone else except Muslims. The silencing of British Muslims because Muslims don't matter. I watch with amazement the indignation of cancel culture when applied to speakers, often male, often white, often far right, often homophobic, often misogynistic and Islamophobic, contrasted to the enthusiastic application of it to Muslims. The hypocrisy paradigm that plays out when it comes to assessing the merits of one against the other. Let me use Toby Young as an example and his appointment to the Office for Students in 2018. Mr. Young was alleged to have made homophobic and misogynistic comments. 
an appointment that the Commissioner for Public Appointment in his report referenced evidence that, I quote, demonstrates a lack of consistency in the approach to due diligence throughout this competition. It did not delve back extensively into his social media, yet the social media activity of the initially preferred candidate for the student experience role was extensively examined, end quote. Interestingly, the Commissioner's report refers to the reasons for one of the candidates being rejected for appointment was, I quote, Ministers concluded that it would undermine the intended policy goals of the new regulator to appoint student representatives who publicly opposed the prevent duty. So cancelled for opposing cancel culture. Note also the irony of Jung's defense of his tweets. Given that defending free speech, this is a quote, given that defending free speech will be one of the OFS's priorities, there's a certain irony in people saying I'm unfit to serve on its board because of politically incorrect things I've said in the past. Some of those things have been sophomoric and silly, and I regret those, but some have been deliberately misinterpreted to try and paint me as a caricature of a heartless Tory toff, end quote. So the preferred candidate, ladies and gentlemen, was denied appointment because of his or her views on prevent, but the defense of free speech justified Young's appointment with his declared caveat that stuff he had said in the past was sophomoric and silly. A privilege not afforded to British Muslims. They're not permitted the privilege of rejecting their past conduct as simply silly. And again, ironically, many have been deliberately misinterpreted and painted as a caricature of an extremist by the very publications that Young himself writes for. One rule for everyone else, a harsher, higher standard for Muslims. Let me move on to another recent example, closure of bank accounts, a phenomenon that has blighted British Muslim organizations and individuals for over a decade. With reports of high street banks like HSBC closing British Muslim bank accounts as far back as 2014. According to the FCA in its data for 2020, the group most likely to be unbanked are Muslims. They are also most likely to be debanked. With banks not being obliged to provide reasons for closure, there has been very little resource recourse for those whose lives and livelihoods have been devastated by such actions. They were not afforded the support of high profile politicians and commentators to pressure banks to account for their actions, nor did we see calls for resignations. Investigations into Muslim bank account closures found that the database world check used by the banks to justify their debanking decisions relied upon political assessments of organizations with Muslim account holders being flagged as posing a quote terrorism risk. The database world check owned by Thomson Reuters is used by 49 of 50 of the world's biggest banks. Peter Obon, the renowned journalist, found that it use, utilizes sources of a dubious nature, including state-sponsored news agencies, in populating entries in the database. Finsbury Park Mosque was one of the institutions that was denied a bank account, and it launched a successful legal challenge to get themselves removed from the World Check database, securing an apology and damages from Thomson Reuters. Despite this, there was no government support for its challenge, no debate or ministerial statement about the injustice inflicted on a British citizen, no calls for an inquiry into the bank's decision, no change of policy, all of which followed the Farage bank closure case. Because unlike the Ferrari sounding Coots Bank and Nigel Farage, you have it, Muslims don't matter. Let me move on to another example, the GB News Wooten Fox saga and the fallout from the interview regarding Ava Evans. Fox's appalling comments were clearly misogynistic, and it was right that he had to go. The Evans interview quite rightly sparked widespread, widespread condemnation for its obvious misogynistic tone. And yet on numerous occasions, both his and Wooten's comments about Muslims have passed without comment or criticism. It reveals something of the normalization of Islamophobia in everyday discourse. And only this week we saw it on display with Richard Maidley's bizarre questioning of Lib Dem Member of Parliament Leila Moran, the question he asked, quote, with your family connections in Gaza, did you have any indication of what was going to happen? Was there any word on the street? Close inverted commas. Let me give another example. Only this week, Jake Wallace-Simons tweeted, we need to face reality. 
that much of Muslim culture is in the grip of a death cult. Let that sink in. Referencing the culture of nearly 2 billion people worldwide, all of whom, all of whom have very different and distinct cultures. And after I challenged him and others, he deleted his comments. The problem is compounded by deliberate obfuscation about what Islamophobia is and what it isn't in a calculated ploy to keep its normalization in circulation without hindrance. Again, only last week, Richard Ferrer wrote, this is plain and simple historic Islamic bloodlust passed down the generations. End quote. Richard Ferrer is the editor of the Jewish News. And again, I challenged him, saying that this was the equivalent of the anti-Semitic blood libel trope. And after challenging him, he changed the word Islamic to Islamist. Yes, that fig leaf again. And felt that that was sufficient. The appalling stereotyping with no consequence, because Muslims don't matter. The consequence of this approach is catastrophic. Societal attitudes on Islam and Muslims in Britain impacts Muslims and demolishes the glue that holds societies together. From the Islamophobia Defined Report and the Nats and British Social Attitudes Surveys to the University of Birmingham Report on Islamophobia in 2022, the findings are shocking. Muslims are viewed less favorably than any other religious group in society. People are more likely to say that they would not want someone in their family to marry a Muslim. Muslim are the UK's second least liked group after Gypsy and Irish travellers. Muslims at 25%, Gypsy and Irish travellers at 44%. More than one in four people and nearly half of all Conservative and Leave voters hold conspiratorial views about Sharia no-go areas. And a majority of Conservative voters believe that Islam threatens the British way of life. Support for prohibiting all Muslim migration to the UK is higher for Muslims than it is for any other ethnic and religious group. Trumpism is alive and well in Britain. British people are more confident in making judgments about Islam than any other non-Christian religion and are much more likely to make incorrect assumptions about it. People from middle and upper class occupational groups are more likely to hold prejudicial views of Islamic beliefs than people from working class occupational groups. It transcends our society. A YouGov tracker on Islam and British values shows that almost consistently 50% of British people feel that there is a fundamental clash between Islam and the values of British society. And it's not just an older generation issue. According to a survey of 6,000 school children by the charity Show Racism the Red Card, nearly a third agreed with the statement Muslims are taking over England. And on average, respondents thought Muslims made up 36% of the population as opposed to the true figure of around 5%. And these views and others have consequences. Racism and exclusion at one end and attacks on the other. Our public discourse is being poisoned and it is deliberate. We are this week marking hate crime awareness. Let me give you some hate crime stats. In year ending March 22, religiously motivated hate crime was up 37%, with Muslims accounting for 42% of all religious hate crime. In the year ending March 23, religiously motivated hate crime was up again by nearly 10%, with Muslims accounting for 39% of all religious hate crime. Muslims have consistently been the most commonly targeted religious group. The impact on the economy of our approach is also real for both Muslim communities and the economy as a whole. The Citizens UK Muslim Missing Muslims report chaired by the ex-Attorney General Dominic Grieve details some of these consequences, cost, quoting the cost of not meeting BME full potential at 24 billion pounds. This is the loss to the UK economy and to all of us. What is also disturbing is that despite Muslims being well represented in higher education, higher numbers are entering university than any other group, they are under underrepresented in professional and managerial roles. Your own Professor Jacqueline Stevenson's report on Muslims and social mobility challenges refers to layers of discrimination in higher education from application to campus experience to degree attainment saying that 
quote, racism and discrimination in the workplace is working to limit aspiration and prevent young Muslims from aiming high and fulfilling their potential. For Muslim women, twice as many were economically inactive compared to other women. And research from the University of Bristol shows the extent of discrimination faced by Muslim women, noting that they are 71% more likely than white Christian women to be unemployed even after controlling for factors such as language ability, education, marital status, number of children, and strength of religious belief. Name blind applications and social experiments with Muslim sounding names show the starkest evidence of direct discrimination, where Muslim sounding names resulted in being filtered out of the recruitment process. Women and Equalities Committee report on employment opportunities for Muslim women in the UK refers to the triple penalty faced by Muslim women, sex, race and religion, combined to leave British Muslims at the bottom of the employment pile. Furthermore, the findings presented reveal that the penalty many groups face in the United Kingdom is of a hierarchical nature. This hierarchy seems to be highly determined by color, ethnic, racial, and religion. So for example, when we looked at Christian groups only, black Christians were the only group to face a significant penalty. But when we examine the black groups, all of them seem to face a penalty with black Muslims appearing to face the severest penalty. But the area I have seen up close and disturbs me the most is how increasingly politics has become the place where British Muslims are silenced, stereotyped and stigmatized. Where over years there has been a closing of the political space for British Muslims in mainstream politics, where you have to be the right kind of Muslim to survive, never mind succeed. Both our main parties have been mired in accusations of Islamophobia. The Conservatives' heel-dragging attempts to challenge it after years of campaigning was a whitewash of a report. Chaired by a controversial figure with historic anti-Muslim comments and did not even manage to garner the support of Conservative Muslim parliamentarians. No consequences followed for those whom even this whitewash of a report accepted were examples of anti-Muslim racism. The Labour Party too, after years of taking that vote for granted, let's not forget, receiving over 80% of the Muslim vote, found itself failing to respond to anti-Muslim racism being experienced by its members. The appalling experience of Conservative Member of Parliament Nusrat Ghani, who was alleged to have been removed from ministerial position because of her Muslimness, sacked for being perceived to be too Muslim. And only this week we see reports of the Labour Party banning its councillors and members of parliament from attending pro-Palestinian marches only, despite having spent months before the recess fighting the government to protect the right to protest in the Public Order Act. The abuse parliamentarians receive who are Muslim or perceived to be Muslim is overwhelming. The death threats, even mainstream respectable individuals such as an ex-Tory donor encouraging violence, suggesting someone, I quote, someone should kill the Muslim mayor of London, end quote, the Muslim mayor of London for his ULES policy. He later withdrew his incendiary comments. Beyond parliamentarians, Muslim civil society has been methodically disengaged by successive governments. Conservative and Labour, over a period of nearly 15 years, with governments cherry picking interlocutors from Muslim communities who do not question or challenge. From the Blair years failed experiment with the now defunct groups like Quilliam and the Sufi Muslim Council to more recent approaches towards the charitable sector. A policy of disengagement in complete contrast to the approach to engagement with all other social groups in society women, race groups, LGBT communities, other religious communities. In all cases, the government rightly makes efforts to include a wide representation from the groups without interfering in group representation by favoring one set of interlocutors over another. And yet in the case of Muslims, successive governments feel justified and emboldened to determine acceptable Muslims, whether representative of Muslim communities or not, 
based on the prejudicial stance that they agree with all aspects of government policy, do not question legitimate areas of concern, and are subject to approval by think tanks and other groups, something that horrified me in government. The outsourcing of these decisions to groups and institutions with vested interests. Using a counter extremism lens to determine which Muslims should be engaged with and even which are to be invited for a samosa at an Eid reception. Favoring those that acquiesce to a state sanctioned belief system and a total commitment to policies that impact British Muslims, however wrong those policies may be. There is a particular irony to this political struggle, because on the one hand, the government insists on the observance of fundamental British values, but when Muslims challenge actions that detract from our commitment to the rule of law, such as torture or rendition, challenge actions that undermine democracy, such as freedom of speech or freedom of association, challenge actions that undermine respect and tolerance, such as institutional racism and Islamophobia, challenge actions that undermine individual liberty, such as what women should wear and not wear. When Muslims apply fundamental British values in their participation in wider society, they are demonized, marginalized, excluded from political arenas and treated as outcasts. The irony is clearly Orwell's dictum. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And after years of being told the community is segregationist and isolationist and not integrating, those of us who participated and encouraged others to participate are faced with accusations of entryism. Many hounded out of their posts or subjected to intense media and political scrutiny. I was accused as such during my time in cabinet, treating Muslims in public life with suspicion, the enemy within. The term used for me as I sat at cabinet and in the National Security Council dealing with the aftermath of the killing of Lee Rigby. A statement and a phrase that hit me hard, but a great title for a book, you should buy it, it's on Amazon. Even referred to as an ISIS sympathizer whilst I, whilst I was myself on the ISIS kill list, a comment only retracted after a legal battle. We are a liberal democracy with a long and proud history we demean ourselves by adopting a totalitarian approach to a section of our fellow citizens, British Muslims. We undermine our stated values. We appear as hypocrites. This approach and anti-Muslim racism must stop. Others too have been sounding the alarm bells. The UN warned in 2021 that Islamophobia builds imaginary constructs around Muslims that are then used to justify state-sponsored discrimination, hostility, and violence against Muslims with stark consequences for the enjoyment of human rights, including freedom of religion and belief. The stigmatization has been drip-fed over decades. And is there any surprise that the polling now reflects as it does? When prime ministers speak about Muslim women as traditionally submissive or letterboxes, when integration reviews are predominantly about Muslims, even as anti-Muslim racism in society is rising, when national broadcasters can broadcast programs titled What British Muslims Really Think, and use selective data to portray Muslims as the enemy within. When think tanks can drive government policy despite their record of Muslim fixation and anti-Muslim hostility. And when national media can get away with asking why a Muslim woman in a hijab is fronting a news report about a terrorist incident in France, when Women's Hour, a flagship program on the BBC, can post a video clip on Twitter of hostile questioning of the first Muslim female to lead a major British Muslim organisation as clickbait, when counter-terrorism policy wants to refocus on Islamist terrorism, even as far-right and other ideologies account for the greater proportion of terrorism sympathisers, we are feeding and creating suspicion and hatred. Muslims were the first victims of the culture wars, which have become a toxic feature of our politics. I have been a racial justice campaigner all my life. From anti-Black racism to anti-Jewish racism, for me, anti-Muslim racism is simply the latest evil. An evil that needs to start by being defined. You cannot tackle what you do not define. 
And I would need a whole hour to tell the story of how attempts to define anti-Muslim racism have been sabotaged over the last decade. But I'll give you a 30 second version. From attacks on staff to pseudo academic posturing about the term Islamophobia, from the exclusion of civil society organizations to leaking and briefing from government departments, to the feeding of false information to the police, to outright lies published in reports and newspapers, the campaign to silence and stop our work has been ferocious. It merits a research PhD if anybody's interested. And the government's disingenuous approach of initially not wanting a definition to wanting one, but one that most Muslims agreed with, to being presented with an agreed definition supported by over 800 Muslim organizations and institutions from traditional to secular, underpinned by over 80 academics who are specialists in this field, framed by a cross-party group of parliamentarians after the largest countrywide consultation and evidence gathering process, including victim testimonies, the government decided it needed to appoint its own two advisors who would find a better definition and then proceeded to only appoint one advisor, give him no terms of reference, give him no ministerial engagement, no resources, and years later, unceremoniously, sack him via a letter in the media. These are the actions of a government that far from tackling anti-Muslim racism, doesn't even want to define it. But here's the good news, that despite all of this, the definition today has been adopted by all major political parties bar the Conservatives in Westminster. My colleagues in Scotland, the Conservatives, have even adopted it. It's been adopted by over 60 councils, trade unions, local authorities, businesses and universities. And I'm delighted to be able to announce that the University of, Le of Leeds has too expressed its intention to adopt and will be taking this forward. I'm grateful for that, Simone, and your team. And I want to... Oh, I need more of those. I can get a drink then. And I want to remain on a more optimistic tone and look forward. We still have an opportunity to reset, to ensure that all in our country belong and matter, to protect all who make up our country. I want the government to formally adopt the agreed definition of Islamophobia as a form of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness, a definition which is neither religious or theologically based and expressly seeks to protect people, not the faith. It, mir it mirrors the definition, for example, of antisemitism. Both are non-legally binding, working definitions which signal intent and a direction of travel. We need a determined and concerted effort to address Islamophobia across all sectors of politics, the economy, education, healthcare, and society. And I ask all of you to adopt it in your workplaces. The all-party parliamentary group stands ready to support you. I want to see the introduction of mandatory reporting on the ethnicity pay gap to tackle employment discrimination and wage disparity as we have done for gender. We need to establish an independent inquiry into the Trojan horse affair to bring closure into this whole disgraceful episode and to identify the areas and actors that failed our school children, teachers and governors and parents in Birmingham and to learn lessons for the future. It's time to establish a judge-led inquiry into prevent, one that considers the evidence and focuses on finding a policy that keeps us secure and protects our freedoms. We must end the government policy of disengagement and allow British Muslims the agency of their own representative bodies, as we do for every other community. And for all of you who care, I ask you to aid what is in effect a Muslim civil rights movement. A demand to belong, to be a part, to play our part, to have the same rights and freedoms as others, to be heard, to have the right to be heard, for our citizenship to be worth the same as everyone else's and to be treated equally before the law. I have great faith in my country and its people. Once the poisonous tap of culture wars is switched off, once those in leadership stop feeding the hate, the ordinary Brit embraces 
and has embraced British Muslims. Whether it's our Cape Queen, Nadia Hussein, World Cup winning cricketer, Moeen Ali, the Egyptian King in Liverpool, Mo Salah, a multi gold winning medalist, Sir Mo Farah, Saliha Mahmoud Ahmed, the doctor and master chef winner, rhythm personified with Hamza Yassin winning Strictly Come Dancing, or Asma Alalak, the surgeon and seamstress extraordinaire that won Sewing Bee, our national life is enriched by Muslims. And I take pride that Muslims are embraced as national heroes in our society. But for many Muslims, the harsh reality of prejudice, stunted aspirations and blocked pathways is becoming the norm. The fear in communities is deep. The plan B exit routes are being prepared. The paralysis and feeling of being si silenced is stifling. And these anxious, fearful, hushed conversations that for too long have gone on behind closed doors now have to be spoken about. I have thought long and hard about what I have said today, and it's why I'm sounding the sirens. Our approach must change. Nearly 70 years after my family's in-country relationship with Britain started, and four generations later, I refuse to accept that my country may not be home to my grandchildren and their children. My grandfathers fought Hitler's armies as part of the British Indian effort. They did not give their blood and sweat for their descendants to be stereotyped, stigmatized and silenced. They did not make sacrifices for the freedoms we enjoy today to see their future generations deprived of those very liberties. They fought for Britain. They helped build Britain's industries and infrastructure. They added colors, sounds and wonderful flavors to the rich tapestry of its culture. And as a young and growing community, British Muslims will once again provide the workforce, the entrepreneurs and the international networks to, if I may repurpose a phrase for better use, make Britain great again. Thank you.